right, so we're going to talk about the Synoptic Gospels. And this is a cool topic because there are a lot of problems that people have with the Synoptic Gospels and with understanding the Gospels that are really unnecessary. And they have really simple solutions. So first of all, what does synoptic mean? Well, synoptic comes from the Greek word synoptikos, and all it means is syn, S-Y-N, means together, and optic means seeing. Optikos, uh, it means seeing. And so it just really means seeing all together or from the same point of view. So we have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are the ones that are the synoptic Gospels that see together. So when we say synoptic, we're referring to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, the fact that we have something called the synoptic problem, uh, it, it causes questions to be raised about the reliability and the authenticity of the Gospels. Uh, you know, we ask questions like, was there collusion? Which one came first? Were they all using the same source? Why aren't they identical? Or why aren't they completely different for that matter? So these kind of questions all come up. We're gonna, in a, in a very superficial way, address most of these tonight. I'm gonna give you some solutions <coughs> and then give you some things to think about as you wrestle with this. But to be honest with you, um, most of this stuff was not that big a deal. So when we read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there are some striking similarities and differences. Um, these three Gospels are alike in a way that the fourth Gospel, John, isn't, but they are all, all four, are a portrait of the same person, and they all reveal the same good news and the same story of Jesus and his ministry here on earth. They all have a similar, the first three, the synoptics, have a similar structure, they have a similar order, and they have a similar sequence. Not only that, they tell the same stories, not 100% the same, but a lot of the same stories, and they often use even the exact same words. Okay, so check this out. 50% of the 1,068 verses in Matthew are virtually identical to, to um, almost all of Mark. There's 668 verses in Mark and 606 of those verses are in Matthew. Right? Because Mark's a lot smaller. So, it, so it's interesting. It makes you wonder what did, what did Matthew do? Just take Mark and expand upon it? Well, that might be one of our answers. There are actually only 31 verses in the book of Mark that are unique to the book of Mark. Everything else in the book of Mark is covered in Matthew or Luke, or both. And some of it, about 6% or so, is actually even covered in John. So if we look at the story of the, of the healing of the leper, uh, we're not going to go through and read it tonight, but it's found in uh, Matthew 8, 2, and 3, Mark 1, 40 through 42, and Luke 5, 12 through 13. This is actually a common example. It's so common that you actually can find a comparison of this on the Wikipedia page. So if you type in Synoptic Gospels and you scan about halfway down the first page on the Wikipedia page, which by the way, I'm not always a fan of Wikipedia, but, uh, but they do a really good treatment. Uh, Matthew 8, 2 through 3, Mark 1, 40 and 42, and Luke, 12, uh, Luke 5, 12 through 13. But uh, Wikipedia does a really good job of covering this material, and if you scan down um, about halfway through the first page, you'll find a big chart that breaks down these three uh, stories side by side, and it'll show you exactly how many words are the same and where they differ, and it shows you to in both the Greek and also in the English uh, translation. So that's a nice little tool. Um, but they all, what you find is that in the story of the healing of the leper, they all tell the same story. In certain places, they're word for word. In other places, they're different from each other. 
And each of the three contains unique pieces of information. I want you to remember that. Some places are the same, some places they're different, but here's something key. They each contain unique information. All right. Another example of a story that actually occurs in all four Gospels is the feeding of the 5,000. And that's where Jesus divides the loaves and fishes. And this is really interesting because Matthew uses 157 words. Don't write, this, don't write these numbers down um, unless you want to try to keep up. But all this will be on the internet and, I'll just, and I can make my notes available to you if you want them. So anybody that wants my notes on that's watching this on Facebook, just let me know and I'll send them out to you. I think we've got some of your ethics students watching right now. Hi, welcome. We'll have some questions and answers towards the end too, so from, from some of the online folks as well. So Matthew uses 157 words, but is never the same as other, uh, never the same as the other accounts more than 59% of the time. So 41% of the time, 41% uh, of Matthew's account is completely unique to Matthew. Okay. Mark uses 194 words. And he's never more than uh, the same as the other Gospels in the 59%. So obviously Matthew and, and Mark are the ones that are the closest together. Luke uses 153 words. And he's never more the same than the others in 44% of the time. And John, now listen to this. John uses 199 words. And uh, John is never more, has never more in line with the, with the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the most he's ever in line with any of them is 8.5%. Small amount, right? And um, out of his story, he only uses eight words that are the same as the other three Gospels. He uses the word uh, five. He uses the word two. He uses the word 5,000. He uses the, the um, phrase took loaves. And he uses the phrase 12 baskets of pieces. That's the only overlap really in the story. But what's really interesting though is that you guys does it, you guys know the word for fish in Greek? Sure. Right. Fish. And it has the ichthus mm -hmm. written in it. Mm -hmm. Ichthus is it means it means um, Jesus is Jesus Christo, Jesus Christ, Ich. That's the I and the Chi, Iota Chi. Theta is Theos. And then the Y is Weos. So that's what the, it's Upsilon. And that means Sun. And then um, S or Sigma is, um, for, is for Savior. So you have Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, is what's said. And when you take the acronym that that forms, it forms the word Ichthus, which is Greek for fish. Okay? Oh. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when they describe the fish that Jesus uses to feed the 5,000, they use the word ichthus. When John refers to the fish, I had, look, I had, had to look this up because I don't know this word off the top of my head because I don't use it. Uh, opsaria, O-P-S-A-R-I-A -A in English is how you would write it, opsaria. It's a different word for fish in Greek. So he uses an entirely different word than they do, which is really interesting. To me anyway right so these similars similarities and differences these cause scholars to ask the question why they go well why is it like this and how do we explain this now simply asking the question why is not an attack on the scriptures and that's an important point because a lot of times people say oh synoptic problem oh really you're attacking the Bible you're a doubter and they get really defensive. And I will say, when I was first in Bible college, I heard this phrase, synoptic problem. I became offended by it. I thought, what do you mean there's a problem? There's no problem to the Bible. But the truth of the matter is that when you're asking these questions and you're looking at, you know, why are there these similarities and differences? Why is it structured this way? A scholar calls out a problem. But for a scholar, it's not a negative word. See, when we hear the word problem, we think of the word of like, well, this is Billy, he's my problem child. <laughs> or we think of like, oh, my wife and I are having financial problems. Or I'm broke down on the side of the road because I'm having car problems. But when a scholar uses this word problem, they're actually using it more like a math problem. 
There's nothing personal about it. There's nothing emotional about it. Something it's solved. just something to be pondered and hopefully solved. To see you would write to solve, and that's the challenge. Think of think of like um, one of those movies where you have you go you'll see like the huge math problem on the board that the professor can't solve, or it's an unsolvable equation. The synoptic problem is really kind of one of those. It's one of those massive problems where the genius walks in the room and still can't solve the problem. Because there really is no actual 100% solution to what we call the synoptic problem. It's a problem for us to look at, examine, ponder, consider, explore. If you're a theology guy or a scholarly guy, have fun with. Now, I don't consider myself a scholar. I'm, I'm kind of like a... If as scholars go, if you're from going from layman to scholar, we can, can compare it to like little league to professional baseball. I'll be like a triple A ball player. I don't have any desire to play in the pros, but I sure love baseball and I want to play um, uh, in the triple A's. So we, we mentioned collusion. Well, was there collusion? And if there was collusion among the early writers, what was the purpose? Was it for deception or was it for the sake of accuracy? That makes a difference. And uh, so we see variation in these stories, and I think that that variation we mentioned earlier between the stories, where the only uh, the feeding of the five thousand at the most is exactly the same between two gospels, fifty nine percent of the of that of that event. I think of that re recounting in the in the between Matthew and, and Mark, as it was. I think the lack of exact word for word copying is actually an evidence that there was not colluding for the intent of deception. So I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine there's a car accident, okay? And we have six witnesses to this car accident. So the police officer starts going one by one. The first three people the police officer interviews, they tell similar stories, but they highlight different details. And some of their details even conflict and some of their details are unique to their stories. Uh, in fact, a couple of them even get the colors of the cars wrong. You know, It's kind of like that problem that we did when we did our first intensive. Exactly. The same story about what was the original text using textual yeah. criticism. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, the next three people get interviewed. And when these three people are interviewed, their stories are not only detail for detail correct, <coughs> They're not only emphasis for emphasis correct, uh, they are word for word in line with each other. Now you tell me which group of three is telling the truth and which one is probably lying. The first group's telling the truth, the second group's lying. Okay, the first group's telling the truth, the ones that have varying stories, and the second group's lying. Why? Because it's too perfect. It's too perfect. Yeah, yeah, people see it from scripted. different perspectives. And from different times, like they might have, one person saw it when it was happening, another person saw it after they heard it. So for everyone to have the exact same story is really right. I was in a, I was at a, a park one time, and there was a young man who was being a monster. He was a young teen, and he was tormenting the kids. He was tormenting the, the, uh, the ride operators for the rides at the park, and he was being extremely abusive to the security officer. And when the and I was actually standing by thinking I was going to have to jump in and pull this teenager off the security officer. When the police show up, this woman comes running from easily 150 yards away, and she's screaming that this security officer was being a bully and picking on these kids, and he feels like a big man, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so I let her say her piece, and then this, before she walked away, I walked over to the police officer and I said, "I've been standing here the whole time. She's been 150 yards away." I'm not sure how she interpreted what she saw visually, but I've heard every word that was said. And let me tell you what actually happened. This kid needs, it needs, it needs to be spanked. He's got some <laughs> serious problems. Um, the woman was shocked, but that's kind of what happens, you know? So we don't know, we know that a true eyewitnesses, exactly as you described, are gonna see it differently, react differently. They have their own filter, their own lens, they make their own judgments. One of them could be colorblind. I don't know, the gray car hit the other gray car, you know, they don't, they don't know. But when their stories are perfect, it's like when a bunch of kids get together, we broke that lamp, we better get our story straight before mom gets home. <laughs> and when they're all telling the same story, you know somebody's lying. So the lack then of word for words throughout the entire story, I think, 
is evidence that there was not collusion for the purpose of deception. In fact, I think of it like this. It's the second half of the first century. The apostles are getting older. Maybe they're dying. Maybe their memories are starting to get a little weak. I was going to say the same thing. Yeah. There's an urgency. There's an urgency to make an eyewitness record. You know, other people are trying to write down accounts of what they've heard, trying to spread it, and they're thinking, man, we were eyewitnesses. We probably should write down what we saw. Jesus taught us we should get this written down. It's kind of like when your older relatives, and with you, I don't know if you guys have experienced this or not, but grandpa's nearing death, and we say, we need to write down grandpa's stories. We need to make sure we have a record of these so we can share them with uh, future generations, right? And so there becomes this concerted effort to get those stories written down. Or if grandpa's already passed and we didn't do that, you know, at the funeral, all of the siblings are there and the cousins are there. If you're smart, you've got somebody either recording the event or writing down those stories, right? Because they're probably never going to be told again. And if they are, they're not going to be told accurately. So you want someone to write those down. And maybe Eric says, remember that time when this happened to Grandpa and this and this? And then Rob says, well, you know, actually, he told me that this detail. And then, one, and then another cousin pipes in, well, actually, I heard this detail. Well, here's the whole story. We put it all together and we figure it out. So I think that's what's going on. I think they're trying to that these that the apostles are they're still in Jerusalem a lot of them and they're trying and they're trying to they're trying to collaborate they're trying to make sure the recollections are true they're trying to decide you know what are the stories that we need to make sure are told to really get across the point to a Jew uh, to a Jewish person that this was the Messiah what are the stories you're wanting to get across the, to make sure that we can show that he was everything he said he was. What are the stories that kind of cover his whole life story? And there, there was probably some discussion about that. So they all get together and decide on the stories that they tell? I don't think ultimately, but I think that there was some, when you have those almost word for word recounting right. of stories. They all just, I mean, out of everything that we just did three years, and they I, all told, I mean, just. I think there were certain stories who became, that became, this is my opinion. Right. I think there were certain stories that became almost like, hymns of the early church where you would just you would retell these stories because they were an oral culture, right? So even though they had the Torah and stuff, these people had tremendous capacity for memorization and they told things in a way that were memorable. And so I think that was what was going on in the early church was this was developing and they're telling each other stories about Jesus and they're retelling these stories and they're, and they're correcting their stories, making sure they're right. Because we know that there's just no way, Paul, uh, John says at the end of his gospel, right at the end of his gospel, he says, my favorite he says, if everything that Jesus did were written down, not all the books in the world could contain it. Stop mm -hmm. for a minute and think about that. Even though they probably had an, an, an extremely, they had an extremely smaller world of books, they still had the Library of Alexandria. I mean, they still had some massive libraries. There were some massive collections of books. All the books in all the world could not contain this information or all the scrolls in all the world. So that means that if they just each wrote down whatever stories came to mind, it would be much more likely that you'd have four Gospels with four entirely different sets of stories. Because there were so many things to choose from. They could have all written about hearing a, healing a paralytic and they were all different paralytics. How many lepers did he heal? How many blind men did he heal? How many diseases aren't even mentioned that he healed? How many situations did he do miraculous things in? How many times did he actually walk on water? Or, you know, did he ever change the weather? Or did he, how many times did he turn water into wine? We don't have any idea because Paul, John tells us it, there's so many we couldn't write them all down. We couldn't even get close. We could barely scratch the surface. So why is it that there's, just, that these, there's this level of repetition among stories? We'll, we'll explore that a little bit more in a minute. But I think I have a good answer for you, a couple of good answers that we'll get to real quickly. So, um, in my opinion, one of the biggest evidence, though, for the authenticity of the scriptures is their treatment of three groups of people. How they treated contemporary heroes. The Pharisees are not treated well in the Gospels. And they were the ideal of the perfect Jew in that day. They were the perfect, perfect Israelite. They were the perfect, you know... Citizen, they were, they were they were following the law to the letter of the law and beyond the letter of the law, and they were, you know, viewed as being so perfect by their contemporaries. And yet, the the gospel 
tears them down. Well, if you're trying to make a book that's going to be popular and it's going to be accepted widely, you're not going to tear down the heroes of the day, mm. right? Their culture wasn't like ours. It would, it, might, it would probably fly in a modern America, but it wouldn't fly then. And the way they treated the, the contemporary outcasts, the Samaritans, the Gentiles, the women, we mentioned that in Luke's Gospel, the treatment of the Samaritans and the Gentiles and the women was so contrary to what you would expect for a Jew who's writing a book or for, or, or for a Christian sect that's writing a book that's trying to convince people that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. Shouldn't he, and that, and that he kept the law perfectly and that he fulfilled the law. You know, you, they would, you would have an expectation that there would be a, a line of thinking along the part of Jesus and reflected in the writings of the Gospels that would reflect the negative view that they had in their culture of Samaritans and Gentiles. And finally, their cultural inferiors, which were women. Um, and uh, women being allowed to be a part of Jesus's group of students, his disciples, people who were learning from him, sitting at his feet and being taught. Why would you include that if you were trying to collude and make a gospel that was going to be awesome and everybody was going to love. It was going to convince people of the authenticity of your message. Why would you include the women as the ones who were the first witnesses of the resurrected Jesus? You know, they couldn't testify in court with any effectiveness. You would want to have men being the first witnesses. In fact, you'd, if you really wanted it to be a powerful story, you'd have a like a Pharisee. Exactly. Mm. You'd have a Pharisee from the Sanhedrin being the first witness of the resurrected Jesus. You'd make sure that was pointed out. In fact, even if they weren't the first witness, that might be. If, but they did witness it. You would probably make that the only one you mention, right? So I think there's some real logical inconsistencies in the Gospels that are present that these people would not have allowed to be in the Gospel. Were the Gospel a false doc? Were the Gospels the synoptic Gospels false documents? And I think. If there was corruption and collusion in the church early on in an attempt to try to sanitize the Gospels and to redact them in a way that reflected positively, those changes would have been made by those later redactors. So I think you really have, because of the lack of consistency, or the, the mild consistency between but not total consistency, because of the countercultural way things are written, I really think that you have uh, some solid, reasonable evidence that the scriptures were, the synoptic gospels are legitimate. But that still doesn't answer the question, where did they come from? How do you wind up with four gospels? Well, John's is easy, right? John wrote later than everybody else. John's gospel is very formatted. He has things formatted with the number seven, um, he has the I am's, the seven I am's. He has you know, the, his miracles and all of those kinds of things uh, throughout his gospel. He's making the case, a solid case for who Jesus was, is, and will be. He's making a case for the divinity of Christ because that was really being challenged and also the humanity of Christ. Those things were being challenged at that time, stage in the game. And it really looks like for John, he ha is familiar with these other Gospels, and he's also familiar with the things that are being, the challenges being raised, and he's writing a fourth Gospel in order to fill in the blanks, to, to supplement those, to, to kind of close the case and say, well, I'm the last living eyewitness, so let me have the final word on this. A lot of stuff being said that isn't true. Um, which is interesting because uh, I, was, I was reading not too long ago about people who in the 1800s, uh, towards the later 1800s, there was a historian who was making a, a beeline across uh, the continental United States trying to contact the last survivors of uh, soldiers who had served under George Washington. The last people alive who had seen George Washington in the person and to get their impressions of him and stuff. You know, it was important information. But the question of the three Gospels is, are they, are they literarily independent? 
or are they interdependent? Now, for most people, the answer is easy. The answer is who cares? Who really cares? The three Gospels are very similar. Uh, they may or may not be literary interdependence there. I don't really care. Um, the Holy Spirit inspired them to write these. That's enough. But scholars over the centuries have proposed many answers to how do we wind up with these three Gospels that are so similar to each other. Virtually all see some kind of interdependence. In fact, besides the obvious similarities in the Gospels, the biggest argument for interdependence, meaning they're all dependent upon each other, or they're dependent on one of them or in some way related, is what's called parenthetical material. Parenthetical material are the um, author's notes or interjections or explanations that are directed at the readers. And in some of the stories in the Gospels, you have the exact same parenthetical material, the exact same note. Now, it's possible that two guys could write the same story and point out the same thing as a parenthetical note for their audience. It's highly unlikely. The other argument for interdependence that's, I think, one of the biggest ones, because uh, there are a bunch of them, I'm just giving you the highlights. Another argument for interdependence is that Matthew and Luke both follow the same overall structure and outline as Mark. So it looks like Mark made a template and they followed it. But there's two really widely accepted solutions for interdependence. The first one that's popular among more liberal scholars is called the Q hypothesis. That's the letter Q. And Q stands for Quelle, Q-U-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, which is a German word, and it simply means source. But Q sounds so much more exotic, doesn't it? Do you believe in Q? The Q document? Now, when I first heard about the Q document, <coughs> I was offended. My spirit <clears throat> was offended. I was like, how dare you say there's another gospel out there? Because in my mind, I categorized it with the people who try to say, no, John didn't write John's gospel. There was a school of Johanna and thought, and it was put together over three different eras in the first four centuries of the church, or, you know, things like that. Or that there's a, that the Isaiah was written by three different groups, and there's, you know, Isaiah, and there's Deuter Isaiah, and Trito Isaiah. And I, so that kind of stuff really upset me because I don't believe it. And so when I heard of Q, I thought, oh man, here's more of these liberal scholars trying to attack the, the integrity of the Gospels, <laughs> trying to say they weren't written by the guys that we believe they've been written by for 2,000 years. And I just kind of blew it off. I was really offended. And I wrote a strong paper in Bible college attacking Q. Um, that was in my apologetics class taught by Dr. Hart for any epic people watching. But what is Q really? Q is really the idea that there was this hypothetical document that was the primary source document that, the, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke used. Basically, some say it was a collection of sayings. And you might say, well, that's not possible, but the Gospel of Thomas is a collection of sayings. And we know the Gospel of Thomas is a false gospel, but it's a very, very, very early false gospel, and it was widely accepted. Not widely accepted, but it was accepted by quite a few folks as legitimate. So the idea of there being a collection of sayings for Jesus was not out of the minds of their own possibility for the early Christians. So it makes me think, okay, maybe there could have been a, a collection of Jesus' sayings that somebody put together. Maybe there were several collections. But there's no evidence remaining that this Q document existed. The only evidence would be where some scholars think they might have found stories in the Bible um, that have been that are that are consistent with one another and so therefore are from Q. 
but there's really no evidence outside of what people have surmised or guessed at or made a scholarly deduction of. And we ask ourselves, if Q was this great document that was used for the sources for the Bible, and it was so, you know, so, so it's a whole great thing, why, didn't, why wasn't it preserved? That's literally what my notes say. Why wasn't it preserved? Or at least, why was there not a reference made to it? And some will try to say, well, Luke's, you know, Luke 1, 1 through 4 is a reference to that, but it's not a reference. It's not clearly a reference any kind of a Q document. But, let's say Q existed. It does not attack the legitimacy of any of the Gospels or Gospel recordings. It simply says there was a document floating around that was believed to be legitimate by the early church leaders. Apostles who were eyewitnesses saw that document and they agreed with its contents based on their experience with Jesus himself, which validates Q, and then they use that as reference material for their Gospels. So there's really no harm, no foul in that. I just think you're kind of reaching and maybe overthinking yourself to get to that. But you don't, again, so knee-jerk reaction, choose the devil, right? You know, it, but it really doesn't have to be like that. You can really just simply be yeah, there could be, there couldn't be. Uh, there probably wasn't, but if there was, so what? That's fun to think about. Um, the only place where I would see like a, a, I don't know if I want to turn this open. The story of the woman caught, turn this over. The, the story of the woman caught in adultery. That story is not in the earliest manuscripts. It's added in later. But here's the thing. When you study the story of the woman caught in adultery, it's not necessary to complete the Gospels because the truths that are revealed in that are revealed other places in the Gospels. So you can take it out and not lose Gospel truth. But when you put it in there, what you see is that it has, it's just like the rest of Scriptures, and especially the Gospels, it has layers. There's things that are not explained there, but why did the old men get up and leave before the young men? Well, if you know Jewish law and you know the Old Testament, you know why. Otherwise, you don't know why it's not stated. You know, all the symbolism that's there, it's so deep and so juicy. Typically, things that are added in are very thin. They don't have that depth and juiciness that that story has. So, I think, personally, that that's a story that was... That was circulated about Jesus that was not in those original Gospels. It was, I think it was, it was added in later. It may have been in some, it was in some documents somewhere uh, that we don't have. Um, question? Yes, similarly to what you were just talking about. Okay. Uh, Michael, I believe he's from your class, at okay. Nick, uh, asks, if Matthew, Mark, and Luke were guided or inspired by the Holy Spirit, and we have over 5,800 complete or fragmented Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin manuscripts, and 9,300 manuscripts in various other ancient languages, including Syriac, Slavic, Gothic, Ethiopic, Coptic, and Armenian. Michael's showing off. To validate the Gospels, then why are we letting 19th century German scholars create a question of writer authenticity? Well, that's the thing, Michael, is that I don't think, I know the 19th century uh, uh, scholars are questioning gospel authenticity, but I don't think that Q necessarily has to do that. Because Q um, is not saying those gospels are inauthentic, it's saying that those gospels may have had another source document that they drew from. So, uh, as I said, it doesn't really harm the authenticity of the gospels to consider that there was a Q document. It's just really unnecessary. It doesn't really advance, it doesn't advance the story, and it's not supported by scripture. So I say, if you're going to go down that road and you're going to believe that, that's fine. Don't keep going down that road where those German um, uh, scholars of that period uh, reject the authorship of the Gospels by the by Matthew them himself, by Luke himself, by John Mark himself, by John the Apostle himself. Don't go down that road. Don't keep going in that road. But if you just stop at Q. And say, well, yeah, sure, that could have, that could have been there. I don't think so, but I mean, sure, it's possible. Then you don't have a problem. I hope that answers your question. Okay. 
The other, the other of the two widely accepted solutions for the synoptic problem is called Markin priority. Not Vulcan, Markin, M-A-R-C-A-N. Now Markin priority, uh, the logic behind that follows like this. Mark is the shortest gospel with the least detail. So it's probably the one that was written first. Other dating of the gospel from other, uh, other sources would tend to agree that it was the earliest gospel. Mark's structure forms the backbone of the other two synoptic gospels, which would lead you to think that Matthew and Luke had access to Mark and they use that as their starting point. Now, if I'm being honest, if it's Scott Bond and I'm and I'm a first century follower of Jesus and an eyewitness and I'm an apostle, I'm not the guy that's going to write an original manuscript. But I am the guy that's going to take Mark's manuscript and say, dude, let me finish this for you. And go back and add to the stories, correct the order a little bit. Because remember, Mark's story in places, you know, it's a little bit out of order because he wasn't there. He's getting the stories from other people, mostly from Peter, and he's doing his best to put it in order, but he's not always perfectly in order. So if I were Matthew, I'd come along and say, all right, kid, you did a good job. Proud of you. Let me go ahead and, and, and add to this and fix it up, which it kind of appears like he did. It appears that Matthew and Luke used this as a framework and then filled in the details. You know, Matthew could have done it from memory. Right, he was there. He could have filled in from memory, and or from other sources that he had had, had access to early on. And um, Luke says he was investigating this. Now, he very well could have been using stories that were circulating. Perhaps he heard a story, and this is all hypothetical. Perhaps he heard a story or read something that was on a scroll. You know, they didn't have newspapers and stuff circulating. It wasn't like they were, he couldn't watch TV, but this. Perhaps he had something like that, and he went to one of the apostles and said, Hey, I read this. Does that sound right to you? Or, I heard the story. Does that sound right to you? Maybe they corrected it or said, Yeah, that's right. That's what happened. So, I tend to agree with Mark and Priority. Mark and Priority is the most popular point of view. Um, I'm not a Q guy, but like I said, I wouldn't shoot somebody for being a Q guy. But if someone says they're a Q person then you are going to suspect they're probably very liberal in most of their theology. And so then they're a JEDP, you know, documentary hypothesis we talked about early on. They're one of those guys. They're probably going to be explaining away the authorship. They're looking for, because the real danger, Mike uh, asked the question earlier, the real danger with that period of time, that enlightenment period during the, the 19th century, is that the fundamental presupposition was that we have outgrown God. We no longer need the miraculous. We no longer need the supernatural. And so we need to look deeper and read between the lines and find the logical, natural explanations for what actually happened. And that's what they were doing. So any place where there appeared to be anything supernatural, they were trying to explain it away. So again, just take one more time. There are some things that they say where we can kind of go, I can go along with you to a point, but in that journey of a thousand miles, that point's probably only 10 or 15 steps. Okay, we're not gonna get much further than that with them on that. So here's what I suggest. When you're looking at the gospels, you're trying to reconcile them, and you're reading stories and you're saying, well, how come here it has this account of Jesus, uh, of who witnessed Jesus' resurrection? Why does it say this one in this gospel? Why does John have to point out that he outran Peter to the tomb? You know, why is that so important to him? I guess as, a, as an old man, he wants to make sure I, I won that race. I beat, you know, um, but still he's my glory days. <laughs> um, why is it? Why is it? Hey, Randy gets it. <laughs> um, why is it so important that he does that? You know, why are there these variations? Well, I would tell you that this. We tend to go to the Gospels and we expect them to be a cold retelling of the facts, like a newspaper article. Uh, when Back when newspaper articles were cold retellings of the facts, not when they were opinion pieces and meant to sway public opinion. 
back when they were just a statement of the facts. There was a fire at 101 J Street, house burnt to the ground, the occupants uh, were all killed. Uh, fire engines 10, 12, and 14 were fighting the blaze. Two officers retrieved for smoke inhalation. They're at Mercy San Juan Hospital. That's just the facts. And that's how we expect the Gospels to be. But let me ask you this. Would you reject a cookbook because rather than simply listing ingredients and measurements, each recipe has a story or a recollection to go along with it? Or would you reject a cookbook because between cookbooks there were slight variations in measurements how much butter you put in how much mm -hmm. sugar you put in you know how long you cook something um, how long you how long do you beat the cake batter you know what do you want the, it to look like before you pour it and put it in don't overbeat your cake batter okay mm -hmm. um, pro tip okay um, I don't really <clears throat> care as long as it tastes good at the end well that's that's <laughs> good so you're gonna want to have you're gonna care if they, they I like beat to it to death stuff through a sifter first there you go. Come on now. Get Personal. that one. All right. <laughs> Remember that these Gospels were written by believers for believers. They were written to reflect the viewpoint of the original witnesses and to minister to, uh, to the original audience. They were not written to you and me. We benefit... Jesus mentions us uh, in uh, John 17, but, uh, but they were not written to us. They were written to a different audience. So we have to put first century expectations on the Gospels when we read them, right? Keep in mind that the writers as well as the audience vary from Gospel to Gospel. So we should expect different approaches different material and even variations on their emphasis. It's very interesting also that there are there are a number of different opinions about what the emphasis of each gospel writer was, who they were trying to write to, who they were trying to minister to. Uh, John is always billed as being towards a Greek audience, but if you have a, Jew, a Jewish person read the gospels, they will tell you that John is the most Jewish of all the Gospels because of all the Jewish subtext. So uh, I think a lot of it depends on who's, who's breaking it down uh, as, to, as to those kinds of things. Well, we cut off kind of abruptly there, but that's because the second part of this lecture will be contained in a later video. I hope you found this interesting and uh, somewhat informative. We want to thank our Epic Bible College students who joined in on this lecture for Atlas Bible College. Uh, we're excited to have you with us today. Please feel free to come back anytime. We're here every Monday night, just about, on our Facebook page at Atlas Bible College. 7, 10 p.m. approximately. We'll be on with a 30-minute to 55-minute lecture. You're welcome to join us. We'd love to have you. We hope that you can learn and grow from the ministry we are providing absolutely for free for the Kingdom of God. If you'd like to know more about how to support our free ministry, our 100% nonprofit free ministry, come to atlasbible.org and click on Donate, or go to at Atlas Bible College on Facebook and check out what we're doing. God bless you. Thanks for joining us, and we'll catch you next time.